My name is Quasi Rollins, the Director of Leadership Programs at the Institute for Educational Leadership, and I'm really happy to be here this morning. And before I bring up our final speaker, on behalf of IEL's leadership team, my colleagues Marty Blank and Curtis Richards, who couldn't be here, we do want to give a big round of applause to Helen Malone and Shana and Jen, because they've done such a wonderful job organizing. This Washington Policy Seminar, uh, Helen is, a, is the, the new coordinator of EPFP, so this was her first big EPFP Washington Policy Seminar, and she's done a fine job, and <clears throat> so we really want to applaud them and be sure to uh, commend them on your way out <laughs> and say thanks. You can never say thanks too many times. So I have the, the great pleasure of bringing up um, a friend and a colleague. When I met Francisco 13 or so years ago, he was a high school teacher at Ed Couch Elsa High School in the Rio Grande Valley of, of Texas, South Texas. Um, and one of the things that he was known for in a group that he helped to found, the Yano Grande Center for Research and Development, was working in a community that uh, on paper was very high poverty, um, majority Mexican immigrant, and theoretically uh, a place that should have been, you know, not, not had a lot of opportunity for those students. And their program had sent hundreds of young people to Ivy League schools all around the country and had great success. In fact, there's, there's one of those students is in the audience today, I won't embarrass her. Um, and their work was featured on Parade Magazine a couple of times and just really did some groundbreaking work and a lot of it just began with the notion that although on paper we have a lot of high poverty, we have our language and we have our story as assets. <clears throat> and building off of that work, I think there's a whole philosophy that, that Francisco will bring to us today in terms of his own leadership journey and also in terms of our own leadership journeys. Since that time, Francisco is now a professor at University of Texas Pan American, and so he's gone from being a very dynamic high school teacher and school administrator to being one that helps to prepare teacher leaders, school leaders, and district leaders, and does so with, with great distinction. And so I bring to you today someone who is a, a master teacher, a master storyteller, a community leader, but perhaps more importantly, a committed son, a committed brother, a committed father, and a committed husband. So all of those things come together to be part of his leadership journey. And so join me in welcoming my dear friend, Dr. Francisco Guajardo. Okay. Muy buenos dias. Okay, so I would uh, like to begin by giving thanks to whoever came up with the idea to commemorate Jack and Dansberger. I, I, I did not know her, but I think I know enough to understand that she was a person of great consequence. And so I, I have to say that I appreciate not only the gesture, but I think the, the programmatic overture and development to recognize her work. And, and, I, and I say that, I think, uh, you know, as kind of a weighty sort of uh, observation, because, you know, those who come before us uh, are very important to me. Uh, and I suspect that, I mean, there's evidence here that, that they are important as well to not only the Institute for Educational Leadership, but also to the program that is the, the EPFP program. And so I, I just wanted to recognize that and then use that as a bit of kind of a spiritual backdrop here to share some stories with you today. So I would like to share some stories. It's part of why I'm here. And, and so I would like to frame the stories by talking about going from the macro to the micro and really situating self at the center of this talk, and hopefully we can have some time for Q&A. So I'm gonna to try to, as best as I can, move expeditiously to get to the time when we can have 
a little bit of, of, of exchange, dialogue. Okay, so the, the first idea that I like to talk about here is that, is that you, all of you, I think, uh, maybe with the exception of those who are stationed here, and live here in Washington, D.C., you come from other places. And so I can tell you that based on, on my experience as an educator and a person who is involved in community, that when I look back at about the, 20, the last 25 years of work back home, that I can point to moments in the history of our organization, the history of our schools, in the history of my own personal and even family life, that oftentimes the changes, the good healthy changes in our community or with us, happened because somebody left and learned something and then brought it back. But when they brought it back, where we saw good healthy growth, it was because they brought it back and they integrated the lessons in a respectful way. Because you know, there's a danger in going out and then bringing something in and just sort of committing to the idea as if the idea is in isolation. So you know, nothing is in isolation. There's, all, there's always that level of respect to history, culture, values of community. And so this I think is pertinent to the realities of many of you here because you are poised now and probably, you know, have been since you began to travel, to really be of some consequence back, back home, because you take something, you know, that you've been, you know, committed to here in the last whatever number of days, three, four days that you've been here, that you've been committed to this intense kind of learning, and so there's that opportunity to go back home and to really break the isolation of being back home. So for as beautiful as back home may be, going away and coming back to infuse respectfully the work back home is always important. It has been important for me. So I want to acknowledge that because I think that many of you are in that kind of situation. And so I would like to first kind of lay out, and I don't want to get too theoretical here, but I do want to lay out a theory of change that, that many of my colleagues and I have been working with. And actually some of the people in this room, Kwesi and Linda and Eddie Ayel, and, and some, you know, some other folks who are very close uh, to this work that we're doing in South Texas are really working according to a theory of change that I'm gonna sort of place in two different ways here or with two broad components. So the first broad component that I'll speak to is something that we call ecologies of knowing. And so the most fundamental, the most foundational part of our knowing in terms of change and action is really the understanding of the self. So today it's mostly about the self Although I want to say as well that there's that second ecology of knowing that is the organization. How do you interact with the organization? How do you know the organization? That's the second. The first, of course, is knowing yourself. That's the most important part. And then the third is community. So how connected are you with community in terms of understanding it, in terms of the relationships you have with community? So the ecologies of knowing I'll put next to the principles that we work with. And so these form an acronym that we call RASPA. And for, for those of you who may be familiar with South Texas vernacular, a RASPA back home translates into a snow cone. And so many of us grew up, you know, consuming snow cones during the summer and at other times of the year because South Texas is actually very hot most of the time. And so we thought, you know, let's create a theory of change to celebrate the whole idea of the RASPA. And so this is what it means. What it means is that it is critical to understand how to build relationships. And so we deal a lot with this whole idea of the anatomy of a relationship. What does it mean to build a relationship? What does it mean to be in relationship? And then what does it mean to have a relationship be a source of action? So I want you to keep, keep that in mind, the relationship, the assets. You know, it's much more uplifting, it's much more inspirational and motivational, really, to live in a place where you're looking at people's gifts and where you are looking at your own gifts. What are you, what's your source of strength? What are your skills? What are your assets? Rather than looking at what do we need? What are our limitations? What are our deficiencies? And for those of, those of us who live you know, within the education industry, we know that it is endemic with needs-based kinds of analyses. In fact, the whole accountability system and even testing you know, we test children so we can find out where they're weak and then we pump resources into their weaknesses. And so it really becomes sort of like 
you know, wallowing in pity oftentimes and in misery oftentimes because we're looking at what kids cannot do rather than assessing what kids can do in building up their gifts. So it's a different philosophy, it's a different point of entry, and it's a different source of inspiration. It's, I wanna work where I'm checking out people's gifts, my own gifts as well, because I think I can go home happy at the end of that day. So there's the relationships, there's the assets, there is the stories. So everybody's got stories. How well do you know your stories? If I were in an elevator and I were to ask any one of you, so what's your story? Can you just blurt out a 30 second story? If you're in an interview, can you tell me your three minute story? Or can you tell me your 10 minute story? So it's important for us to know our stories, to understand them and how to use those stories as a source of strength. And especially for children, understanding their stories, cultivating them is really critical. So there's relationships, there's assets, there's stories, and then there's place. And so place comes in two different ways. There's the actual tangible physical place, and then there's the metaphorical place. I will talk more about this as I move along with my talk. And then there's the, the, the whole idea of politics. This is not politics, but this is about an ethic of behavior. How can we nurture a culture where people are behaving for the public good? Where you're doing things to help your community, where you're doing things out of generosity and for each other. That's a very particular consciousness and a very distinct place of action. And so this is politic. And then the last piece is action. So how do you deal with relationships and with stories and with assets and how, do, how does all this have a kinetic quality? How does this all move? And so this is a theory of change and action. It's with the ecologies of knowing and then the different principles that we work with. So I wanna ask this question. And if, if all of you can sort of think about this question as we move through this talk. And actually the last session, I was overhearing you know, what was happening in, that, in this last session and you were actually dealing with, with yourself and yourself as a leader. And what does your work look like? And what, you know, what does it all mean? You were making meaning of your own leadership capacities and work. And so I, this is not a prompt that is new because you've been thinking about this for the last few days. All right, so I, but I wanna encourage you to continue to think about this, especially as I share stories. So then the question would be, how, how do my stories connect with your work? So I want you to think about that. So I wanna spend the next few minutes sharing a few stories about self. You know, because when I put self up, up there, that already suggests that I need to tell you who I am. And so this is important. And in fact, it was why I was invited to share some stories, you know, about my own work. And so I'm, I'm going to begin by reiterating some of what Kwesi already said. So I am from the lower southernmost tip of Texas. My thing doesn't work, I guess, but you see it there. I was raised in rural South Texas, but I was actually born in Mexico. My father comes from the state that is highlighted there, the state of Nuevo Leon. So my father grew up very rural. And you know, he, in a village, a tiny little village, and so he would walk to school a couple miles, that sort of thing. He went up to the fourth grade. My father loved school. My father would meet my mother in the neighboring state of Tamaulipas back in the late 1950s. And so my parents would marry and they would have their family. And so I am one of four boys. And so we decided, my parents actually decided in mid-1968 that they had to make the move from Mexico into the United States. There were a whole host of factors that were very compelling push factors that really pushed us out of Mexico. And then there were, of course, you know, the pull factors as well from north of the border. And so this is actually an image of when my father took my brothers and me to the Mexican consulate in Monterrey, Nuevo León. And so I'm the kid in the middle there. And then off to my right is my brother Miguel, and off to my left is my brother Pepe, we call him. And so there's my father, and you see the seal of La República de México. And so we, we went through the whole application process, and then eventually got permission to come across the river, the Rio Grande River, and then we settled in this place in South Texas. So I want to begin by first introducing my family. So my brother there in the, in, in the pink shirt, Pepe, he's a retired, retired school principal. And so Pepe has a doctoral degree in divinity. So he's kind of a religious guy. And then, and then my, my mother was mourning the death of my grandmother, 
And, and then my brother in, in the middle, kind of the chunkier one, that's my brother Miguel. And he's the one who ate all the tortillas most of the time. And, and, and Quasi knows my brother Miguel well, as does Linda. So Miguel is a university professor in San Marcos, Texas, at Texas State University. And then I'm kind of the skinny, scrawny kid there. And I've got my hands on my little brother. And so we all have teaching certificates, teaching degrees. And the three of us, the older ones, became teachers. My little brother is the one who was smart, and he makes the money. And so we, you know, we are on teacher salaries, which is actually not bad. But my brother does a little bit better than we do. And my father there is, uh, is my father. So we lived in the housing projects. And we lived in the housing projects for eight and a half years. Federal housing that was built in the 1960s in Elson, Texas. So the first story that I want to share is a story about Papi, what we call my father. And I'm going to actually back into the story by beginning my father's story um, at his funeral. So my father died about two years ago. And at his funeral, we showed video um, of my father when I posed the question to him in one of the many installments of an oral history that I did with my father. So I, I had been doing an oral history with my father for a good 17, 18 years when he passed away. So I, I have my brothers. We have a preponderance of data on the life of my father. And, and so five years before he died, as I turned the camera on, I asked my father, ¿Cómo quieres que se acuerde la gente de ti, papi? I asked him, how do you want to be remembered? And, and so, you know, as he was dying, I actually brought that video back to my father so he could see it. And so that he could reflect, you know, on some of the stuff that he has shared with us through the years. And so then when he passed away, I decided that's the video I want to show at the funeral. And so my father was speaking to multiple audiences. That one day when I asked him, he was talking to the camera only and to me. But when he was talking at, a at the funeral, it seemed like he was talking to the camera, he was talking to his children, he was talking to his grandkids, and he was talking to posterity and the community, it seemed. And so he said to the camera and to everybody else, he said, I want to be remembered as somebody who was, this is all in Spanish, because my father never learned English, neither did my mother. So my father said, as somebody who was cumplido, he said. Yo fui cumplido. So it's hard to translate. But it means that I am a person who is committed. I will have fidelity to the relationships I have. I will have fidelity and I will have commitment to my children. I'm going to be committed to my community. And I want people to know that, he was saying. So at least 100 people are sitting in the, in the funeral home. And they're listening to this. And I'm checking it out and I'm, I'm thinking, wow, what a great teacher. You know, what he's saying is, look, this is the lesson from dying. At my funeral, I want all of you to be good to each other and I want all of you to be committed. Quiero que sean cumplidos. So I began to really think a lot about my father and my mother when I left home. So I left home at the age of 18. I graduated from high school in 1983 from Ed Cauchosa High School and I went, off, I went off to Austin. I went off to Austin to become a teacher because my father had sort of set us up that way. You know, my father went to the fourth grade, as I told you, but my father so loved school. He went to the fourth grade three times, by the way. <laughs> Why do you suppose? There was no fifth grade. He had to have gone to the big city, but he was fearful of that. And so he stayed in his rural school for three straight years, and he kept all his books. And so as I went to college and I became an English major, you know, I was like fascinated with the bard. You know the bard? Yeah, and so I was fascinated with, you know, British literature, and so I thought that, like my father, because my, my father had a little bit of Don Quixote in him, maybe a lot. And so he was, very, I don't know if the word is quixotic or quixotic. What's the word? What? Quixotic. Quixotic, quixotic. My father was quixotic. He was, in some ways, you know, an unrealistic dreamer. And so all my brothers and I got that from him. And so when I went to the University of Texas at Austin, you know, I thought that because I was an English major, I was supposed to study in England as well. And so I applied for this fellowship 
you know, <laughs> this is a Picasso's rendition of, of Don Quixote. I applied for this fellowship to study abroad. And so I would get a fellowship to go to Oxford University in England. And so my pointer's not working, but you can see the map there. And so I went to, I went to study British literature at Brazenose College in England. I wanted to be immersed. Right? I wanted to go up to Stratford-upon-Avon to the Shakespeare Theater. I wanted to walk the streets of London like Dickensian characters did. I wanted to go up to Haworth to visit the parsonage of the Bronte sisters. I wanted to do all that. And I did. And when I did, I realized I had my epiphany. As I was immersed in this British literature at Oxford University is when I realized what I really wanted to study. I wanted to study my father's story. I wanted to study my mother's story. I wanted to study the literature of Mexican people in this country. What? How did I go from Shakespeare to that? It was the most beautiful thing, I have to tell you. So when I got back home from JFK Airport, in New York City, I called my father. And I said to my father that, you know, I so appreciated the way he and my mother had raised us, and all these stories were gold. And, and I asked my father, did you write any of that down? Did you write any of your stories? And my father said, no, I didn't. Although my father was a copious note taker. My father left behind books and books and books of notes. But not narrative, just notes. And so I, I knew that. All my brothers know that. And we knew that. And so I asked my father, have you ever written the stories, you know, from those notes? And he said, no. I asked my father if he would. And he took the next year of his life to write his autobiography. And, and it was the most beautiful thing, I have to tell you. You know, and when many years later, it, so, okay, so one of the things that my father writes about most is about going to the rural school. And so my father was not only quixotic, but he was also a romantic. And so he and I would go to his little village where he actually went to school. This is his rural school. That my, and this is one of the benches that my father sat on in the 1940s. We actually stole this bench and took it across the border. <laughs> <laughs> it was a very scary proposition getting past like Border Patrol. You know, I put it in the back of my truck. That bench I have at home. And, and my father was, you know, even more like... The Start a fundraising campaign to bring the school back to life. But the school is in a ghost village because all the people from there left to the U.S. You know, during the last 50, 60 years. But still, in San Felipe, Nuevo León, my father wanted to resurrect his school. He so loved school. And he wrote stories about that in his autobiography. When my father retired, he retired as a school janitor at Ed Couch Elementary School. For many years, my father was a laborer, worked in the fields, irrigation, drove tractors, worked at the sugar mill for a, for a spell. But then, you know, he left the really, really hard work to go become a school janitor. It was like, you know, the great job for him. And so he worked as, as a school janitor the last 10 years of his life. And my father was a scavenger ja uh, janitor at his school. So at the, at the elementary school, every day, of course, he would you know, get the trash cans and he would dump the trash cans, but he wouldn't just dump them. He would go through the trash cans because my father knew that teachers threw a lot of good stuff away. And so he would collect the stuff and then at the end of the day or the next morning, he would go talk to the principal and he would ask the principal if he could keep this or that or whatever. And so the principal always said yes. And so my father had in his little library at home where he had all of his books from the 1940s. He kept all his books, by the way. He had these things that he had collected from the trash cans, big scrolls. On those scrolls, my father wrote his autobiography. I'm gonna show you, this is many years later, this is actually, I was like maybe 23 years old, and I decided that I was gonna transcribe my father's autobiography. And so this is one of the many scrolls. And so there I was typing away. And one of those Tandy 1000s, you guys are too young, but you know, t the, one of those Tandy 1000s, my very first computer. And my father wrote about La Escuela Rural. This is actually from a book that he kept from 1943. La Escuela Rural had all these stories. So my father would pull this one book. He pulled out several books, but this, is, this was his favorite. And so he read to us about La Escuela Rural and about this little Mexican boy named Pablito. And so Pablito in this story actually graduated from the rural school and then he went off to the city. And then he graduated from the school in the city. And then you know what he did after that? What do you think Pablito did? He came back home. 
to help develop his village. So for us, the stories that my father was sharing with us and reading to us became really the roadmap for us. So all four of my brothers, you know, went off to school and then came back. Three of my brothers and then myself, the fourth. So I share this story about my father because, you know, as I look at my own leadership, I can tell you that I would not have the kind of capacities, I wouldn't have the kind of skill sets if I hadn't spent years and years and years, and by the way, this is a fluid, dynamic process. I continue to. I write in my journal. And so like last year, for example, my journal was 292 pages. This year, I'm on page like 120. I write in my journal every single day. Like I'm gonna, I'm gonna write about today, I'm gonna write about this as I fly home this afternoon. I write in my journal every single day. And I write in my journal because it's something that I learned from my father. And I write in my journal because I understand that I have to know myself and I need to continue to grapple with that. Grapple is the wrong word. I need to continue to reflect. Critical self-reflection and the building of the self is like the cornerstone of leadership. So while the macro is important, go to Washington Learn, even more critical, even more important is you and what it is that you do and what it is that you're about. So that's story number one about my father. So I'm gonna tell you a story about Don Isabel. But first I'm gonna, I'm gonna give context to Don Isabel. When I was a high school teacher, one of the things that I, that I did as a teacher with some other teachers on the faculty was that we engaged in what we call community-based research. You know, when I, when I was an undergrad, I actually studied you know, uh, Chicano studies. You know Chicano studies? Mexican-American studies, part of the ethnic studies kind of, you know, um, genre. And so I was like steeped in that. I was an English major, yes, because I love Shakespeare, but then when I had my epiphany, I thought, I need to study now, you know, my people is what I thought. And so then I went back home, and I was like full of it. And so I remember my first, first day, first week as a high school teacher, I said to my students, we're going to study Chicano history, we're going to study Chicano literature, and you know, like living in the 1960s, it seemed, right? <laughs> I began to get calls at home from parents saying, what is this Chicano stuff you want to do? And you know, the people that I wanted to work with to try to build a level of consciousness, a critical consciousness with, were challenging me on the label. So then I sort of wised up and I said, I don't think I want to sacrifice that because I think it's critically important that students know who they are, that young people know who they are in history, to know that, you know what, Ed Couch and also were segregated towns. The railroad tracks separated the Mexicans from the white people. Do kids need to know that? Of course they need to know that. They need to know why it is that Title I is what it is. They need to know, you know, levels of inequity in our community. They need to know that. We all need to know that. Not only students of color. Everybody needs to know that. But the parents were telling me, you can't talk about Chicanismo with, with my children. Ugh. So that was a challenge. So the way we figured it out is that, is that we went to community-based studies. Code for Chicano studies. <laughs> we went into community-based studies. We went into oral histories. So then I began to train my students. I don't, need to, I don't need to say Chicano anymore, I thought, because it's a bad word. I don't need to go there. What I need to do is exercise the values that I really think are important, such as having students understand themselves, such as having students understand how to have a conversation, how to do an interview, having students understand how to listen, having students understand how to do a follow-up question, having students make sense of this experience of talking to an elder. That's, that's like black studies. That's like Chicano studies. That's like, you know, whatever, ethnic group studies. Because all of that stuff is based on that, you know? It's on, based on knowing your community. So even in the graduate program, now I, I train emerging school leaders. I have my students who are, who are preparing to become principals go out into the community and talk to the elders around a particular theme. And so everybody has a responsibility. You gotta get out of here. You gotta go talk to people in the community. One of the very first oral histories that we did with high school students was with this man named Isabel Gutierrez. Don Isabel Gutierrez happened to be born in 1900 on a day 
that on the calendar it says it is the day of Saint Isabel. On the Mexican calendar, every single day has a saint assigned to the Mexican calendar. And so this man happened to, be, to, to have been born on the day of Santa Isabel. So his mother gave him the name Isabel. Isabel Gutierrez. So we went to Don Isabel's house. This is about 1996, 1997. I took my high school class to Don Isabel's house. And we spent an afternoon with him because another elder in the community had told us that we really had to go talk to Don Isabel. Because the other elder said, Don Isabel was one of the founders of Ed Couch, this tiny little town where Don Isabel lived. Now, in doing our own due diligence, we you know, researched Don Isabel. And we found out that Don Isabel, for many years, 70 years almost, had been a labor, hard labor. In fact, Don Isabel worked when he came from Mexico doing this, clearing the brush in South Texas to establish the town sites. So we're sitting with Don Isabel. And this one soon named Orlando is leading in the question. He's 15 years old. And so Orlando sees Don Isabel, who was like five foot two, you know, and walked around with a walker. And so Orlando asked Don Isabel, Don Isabel, a neighbor said that you were one of the founders of Ed Couch. So the question was with the level of skepticism Don Isabel found. And so as Don Isabel receives this question, he stood up in a very erect way. He asked the kid, it was all in Spanish, by the way. He asked the kid, Joven, he says, young man, have you ever had any water here in Ed Couch? And so the kid says, of course, Don Isabel, I drink water in Ed Couch all the time. So Don Isabel says, in 1926, he said, I dug the ditches to lay down the water pipes for the city of Ed Couch. Yo soy fundador de Ed Couch. Imagine that. This old man is telling us that he's one of the founders of Ed Couch. This, this, this old man turned the whole script on its head. This old man was telling us that just like George Washington, the founding fathers, you know, rightfully should be labeled as, as founders, this old man, a laborer his entire life, was speaking for all laborers and saying, we have something to do with building these towns. Yo, he said, and he stood up. Soy fundador de Ed Couch. It changed everybody's life. Everybody who was there. Their lives were changed forever. This is about place. This is about stories. This is about assets. And then we built a relationship, Don Isabel, with Don Isabel, yes. This is a powerful story, Don Isabel. So are you kidding me? So the third story is the story of my mother. And so my mother was the very first oral history interviewee that we did. And so one of Edel's good friends, actually, Edel, raise your hand over there. She's one of my old high school students. One of Edel's friends, Olga, went with me to do an oral history. And we took a couple of other students from the high school. And so we sat down with my mother. And so my mother began to tell stories. And so this was the very first time that we put her on, on camera. Right? And so she was a little bit nervous at this time because we put a lavalier mic on her and the whole thing. And she wasn't really like, you know, comfortable with the technology. Not like on the third installment where she would pin up the lavalier mic herself and then she would tell me where to place the camera because of lighting and that sort of thing. <laughs> so this is my mother who's really like, you know, even though she was born in 1934, my mother is like a 19th century person, you know, like almost pre-industrial, very agrarian type culture. And so we had this interview with my mother. And, and so, you know, in the early goings of the interview, my mother reaches into the family album and pulls out this little tattered, like a two by three photograph. And she asked me, Mijito, has visto tu este foto? Have you seen this photograph, mijo? And so I, I had seen the photograph, except that I didn't know anything about it, except that this is my mother and this is my oldest brother, Pepe. So my mother proceeds to tell me the story, but before she tells me the story, she's got a lot of questions. You know, like, have you ever seen this? And I said, yes. What do you think of the dress, mijito? Isn't this a beautiful dress? And I said, of course, mommy. And then other questions. And then she tells me that she went and got this friend, like the only friend she had who had a camera, 
to come take a picture of her with her baby. Because my mother was absolutely convinced that she was not going to make it. She needed to leave a photograph so that her baby could know what she looked like. And she pointed to, to the dress again to ask what I thought of the dress. And she wanted to continue with the story of the dress. She said, for weeks on end, I put that dress on to go to bed. And then I would take it off in the morning. And so I'm trying to make sense of this. I don't know what to make of it. What, what do you think the story is? What? Yeah, my mother wanted to be buried in the dress. So I, I explored, you know, as a good interviewer would. And I found out, and my mother told me, that she was suffering through postpartum depression. She just didn't know what it was. And so I asked my mother, so how many people know this story? My mother said, I never told this story. She was about 62, 63 years old, my mother was at this time. She had never told the story of postpartum depression. I asked her, what? Like, you didn't tell your sisters? You didn't tell your comadres or whatever? She said, no, I never told this story. She said, I feared that I would be branded an unfit mother, and I didn't want to lose my baby, but if I did, you know, die, I wanted my baby to have a memory of what I looked like. Why would I even share this story? Why would I share this story? You know, we work in schools, or we work in organizations, or we work with the government, or we work with children every single day. And oftentimes we see a sour face on a child, or on a colleague, you know, or on somebody walking down the street. And, and most of the time, most of the time, we have no idea why the countenance. I had lived 30 years or whatever, 30 plus years, 30 years, and I had no idea that my mother, most important woman in my life, had had this story. It wasn't until I reached the level of the relationship with my mother, it was already, you know, strong, but a relationship that is at a whole other level, like trying to get to know you, really, trying to get to understand your stories. When I found out this story about my mother, and I thought, wow, this is crazy stuff. So my mother really pushed me, without even saying it, to be much more curious about the people I work with every single day. And, you know, to be much more curious about the relationships I have. And I have to tell you that that sit down with my mother enriched my life in such a way. It was unbelievable. I'm glad I had the epiphany at, at, at Oxford. Because I don't know that I would have done this. So you see, there's the macro piece, which is important, which is why you're here, and then there's the micro piece. So how well do you know yourselves? So that you can become, really, you know, a much more enhanced leader. It's probably the wrong descriptor, but you know what I'm saying. A deeper level of understanding of who you are. And so, you know, I'm, I'm talking about my mother because my mother laid out this vision for me. I think in the, in the most profound way. So this is my mother and my father. And so, you know, I, sh I shared some stories here. And so I, I, I talked about the self. You know, I talked about organizations a little bit, and then I talked about community. And Don Isabel, like, revolutionizes the whole idea of community. And, and so I think that all the stories that I shared have something to do with relationships and and you know, with, with assets, identifying and building assets, you know, and stories and place and politics and action. So I want you to think about what your work is back home, as you have been thinking now for a while. And so I want to finish by, before we get to the Q&A here, I want to finish just by extending Don Isabel's story because you know, Don Isabel didn't have a phone but he went to an adult daycare center during the mornings. And so the phone in my office rang at the school, rang one day, and it was Don Isabel. You know, and so it was a student who picked up the phone, and then he ran to me and said, Don Isabel is calling from the adult daycare center, the student said. And so it turned out that Don Isabel was calling because he had a request to take more journals the Llano Grande Journal, that was a student publication based on the oral histories. He wanted about 30 more copies of the journal because the elders at the Adult Daycare Center wanted more. 
And so we said, of course. So we ran off a bunch more, a box, and we took the box to the adult daycare center. So I walk in, I got like a whole you know, team of students, and they're passing out the, the journals, Yano Grande Journal, featuring Don Isabel Gutierrez, right, his story. And so as the students are passing around, all these elders you know, like are riveted to the journal. And so the director of the adult daycare center comes over to me and taps me on the shoulder, and he says, you know, more than half of those elders who are reading the journal are illiterate. Think about that. And think about what literacy means. And think about what literacy means to a lot of folks in our community who absolutely can read. They can read, you know, in the Freudian sense, they can read the world. You know, but give people a chance to tell stories and they become the greatest authors. You know, those people who have been for years on the margins, bring them to the center. Have them excavate the treasure of stories. I'm available to respond to questions. Or an observation or maybe a comment that somebody might have. I'm happy to, to field you know, whatever anybody may have. And as I understand, there are two microphones there that, uh, that anybody can get up and speak into, or you can just yell it out from where you may be. Yes. What, what is your name? Dominic. Dominic, where are you from? You're from DC. OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Dominique, for the, for the question. She asked, you know, how did you go about you know, doing the oral history? Is there, is there, say, like a template, you know, of questions, uh, or, or is it much more organic? And my response to you is that, you know, as I train students on how to do this, and young people and also, you know, older people, you know, the first thing to do is really assess who it is who I'm training. You know, there's some people who just want to do the conversational thing the platica, right? They want to engage in conversation. They want to do it over coffee and stuff like that. The oral history that we do formally now, because right now I'm in the middle of, of doing an oral history of bilingual education in South Texas. And so when I bring in elders, you know, who are leaders in bilingual ed, it's around a round table with coffee. And for me, it's conversational. But there's some people who need a script, and that's okay. And so the script, when I, you know, when I have conversations with people around the science of, it really is more of an art form than a science, is, is you, you do an oral history in two parts. Number one, you get the baseline data. You get the absolutely essential information that will be very genealogically you know, sort of valuable. You know, so name at birth, what about the name? Your parents, what about their names? Where were they from? Where were they born? You know, what about the grandparents? What were their names? Why those names? You know, those kinds of things. And then, and then move forward. And, and you can move forward in a number of different ways, but you know, they're usually chronologically is good. And so you wanna, you wanna get the essential information. And so that's part one, where you went to school, you know, who were your teachers, your siblings, you know, where you grew up. And then part two is the stories. And the stories always stem from the first part. And so kind of a principle here is to really allow the conversation to go in the way that they want it to go. Unless, of course, you have a prescribed kind of thematic, like let's say you're doing you know, a, a, an oral history of World War II you know, veterans in the region. So you, know, you really want to focus on that as well. But as much of the organic kind of you know, spirit that you can infuse into an oral history, the better it is. And also just being really culturally respectful. Yes, sir, what is your name? My name is James Ford. I'm the North Carolina Teacher of the Year. First and foremost, I want to Whoa, say thank James. you. Whoa, James, woo! Don't clap for me, on, clap for on, him. Hang on, hang on, hang on, James. <laughs> Tell me the one thing, the one thing that put you over the top in the application process when you became the Teacher of the Year. What was the one thing, James? Um, I don't think there's one, love, I guess? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's all you need to say. Yeah. That's, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I was, what you had to share was riveting, it was personal, um, it, struck, it struck a personal chord within me. Um, 
and I wanted to ask you, I teach a um, very diverse population, um, the most diverse high school in all of North Carolina. And uh, when you spoke to wanting to go back and teach about your kind of history, right, and wanted to invigorate and inspire your young people, I wanted to ask you the critical question of why do you think that was important to do? Because it sounds like you, you taught literature or English. Yeah. So there are those who say, teach the content. You know, that, that, that grounding in, in, in cultural nuances and proficiency, why is that necessary just to communicate the content? But, you know, for a person who may not be of that culture or somebody who's coming from the outside, myself included, I had to learn that information to be able to convey that to my young people before I felt like I, I could effectively communicate the content. But why is that necessary? Why is that so important uh, in terms of being an effective yeah. communicator and teacher? Yeah. So, you know, James, I, I'm, I'm actually not even going to speak to the political importance, even like the historical importance. I think that is, is key. But here's the biggest reason. The reason that I thought that doing this would be important to my students is because I wanted to engage them, who they were, where they were in, in history, in community, and that's what, so I can do that in Alaska if I want, right? But it's really about finding, finding the paths through which to connect with students. And it just so happens that ethnic studies is so much more friendly because ethnic studies is really about, you know, I mean, it really is all studies should be. It's about finding your soul, finding your spirit, finding your stories, finding your core, finding your values. You know, who am I? Right? And that's, I mean, that's really how education should be across the board. And I, have to, I happen to think, James, that this is actually one of the dis disservices that we do. You know, that there's standards, right? And there's testing and all this. You know, if we can know how to dominate the standards, and see that within the standards there's enough elasticity, enough flexibility to get to this kind of stuff, then kids can become very literate, very numerate, very whatever. But it is really about finding the connections with them. And, and by the way, then that will you know, breed a politicization, a, a culturalization, you know, a historical kind of grounding. So all that other stuff is good, but I, ha I actually happen to think that it, it may be secondary. I mean, it's... You know, like when, when Spike Lee read Malcolm X, he said, this is the most important book I will ever read, I will, I will ever have read, something like that. And, and I saw an interview with Spike Lee once where he said that that book and the words that I was reading just changed my life because I saw myself in history. So this is what Malcolm X did. He was able to reach out to the audience and say, look at yourself. I think that's what it is. And I think that we all want to be important. All right, so let me study myself. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, James. I, I, I think that may be it, except that you know what, you have to, they have two questions, Helen. Sure. So let, no, 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 stay, 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 no, no, stay, stay, stay. Go ahead, what is your name? Uh, my name's Christy Poitra and I'm from Michigan. I am a product of ethnic studies from UC Berkeley. Wow. Um, and the, I, I think the very first eth ethnic studies program came out of Berkeley. So, so wow, I, steeped in history. Go ahead. Yes, my study is mostly in sort of the ways American Indian tribal governments create policies for their youth. Um, so my question for you is, um, in the process of studying your oral history, um, did that change the way you understood the interconnectedness of sort of self-interest, family, and your community? It did. You know, I, and I, I think that, yeah, we need to have you back up here for the question. I think the most important thing, was it Christy? Yes. The most important thing, Christy, about understanding or, or the lessons that I've learned, and I continue to do oral histories, was, was just the necessity of knowing how to listen. And so then the listening took me to the different ecologies of knowing. You know, and the listening took me to this greater appreciation, you know, for the spoken word, you know, to a greater appreciation for, you know, elders and struggles and triumphs and all of that. I think that the oral history, now, a lot of this is about how you make meaning of it, to be sure. It is about, because, you know, you can do oral histories that are just absolute treasures, and you may not think anything outside of just the superficial understanding of them. So this is so much about gaining a critical awareness, a critical consciousness, and critical thinking, yes. And so for me, doing the oral history just opened up like a whole world of understanding, you know, and, and created so many opportunities for intersectionalities, you know, around issues of race, you know, gender, uh, class, culture, history, economy, just so much.
And, and these were like authentic authors, every single one of them, authentic authors. Thank you. Thank you. What is your name? Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Braulio Carrasco. I'm a math teacher from Minneapolis. Braulio Carrasco. That is a uh, cool name, Braulio. Where, where do you get your name from, Braulio? Well, my question kind of is related to this because um, I've always had a hard time with, with telling my own story. Yeah. Part of it being I'm a Dominican living in Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> and the re what I'm stood up here to ask is I don't have access to, to my elders. I don't have access to much of any of my community in Minnesota. As we work with more and more diverse students, how do we get to those stories of self when we, I haven't seen my grandma in 10 years, you know, immigrant stories, you know? Um, I don't know, I just wanted you to talk a little bit about that. How do you do that? Um, I really should be living in the Bronx, but I'm, I'm not. <laughs> and I feel that disconnection, so, you know, yeah. I'm Latino in Minnesota, but I'm part of a largely Mexican community where I, I've adopted that identity, but I also get lost in that. So I don't know, I just... Yeah, no, no, I, 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 I hear you. Look, I was a, a Mexicano in Oxford. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and, and it was really about, you know, stepping outside of myself. And I think that's, that's what this is, Bradley. Although for you, I think some very tangible things. Look, you just laid out your plan for the next 10 years. <laughs> Didn't he lay out his plan for the next 10 years? Yes. <laughs> just go to the videotape and check it out, Dalio, because I think what you said is I actually need to go somewhere to be with people so that I can learn more about myself. And then I can bring it back to Minnesota. I was asking about my students. How do I ah, yeah. do that for my students? <laughs> yeah. Hey, I got to tell you, look, that, that there is nothing that is stopping Braulio or his students from traveling. Whatever school policy there may be, there's a way around it. Whatever policy, and, and you can import people, by the way, that may be less expensive. Although I have to tell you. They're coming to Minnesota, by the way. They're coming to Minnesota. You know, I can tell you that when Eddie Ayel, you know, traveled with us on a college trip to California, it changed her life. You know, actually when Eddie Ayel, you know, swam across the Rio Grande at the age of 12, that changed her life. You know, when Eddie Ayel was one of the leading spokespeople for the DREAM Act in Texas, that changed her life and it changed the entire state's life. So this is stuff that if you say it, brother, and you already said it, now you gotta own it. I, by the way, that's the stuff of leadership. And, and you've got the instinct. This is why you got up to ask the question. You know, cause you're, and you're probably not leading on enough, you know, of the kind of good work that you're doing. Cause you're probably doing a lot of this stuff already. You know, but if it's a work in progress, I would say expedite it, speed it up, bring people in, you know, to represent the different cultural groups of your students. And by the way, this is not, you know, like rocket science. This is very basic stuff. This is about, you know, me and you and having a deep understanding of who we are. And that, by the way, you know, Latson Billings talks about culturally relevant pedagogy. It's like when kids know themselves best is when they become much more culturally respectful of others. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, I appreciate it. I'm gonna take this one. Are we going to this one? I gotta talk to Braulio. All right. Can we have another round of applause for our closing keynote, please? <laughs> well, and now we come to the end. And before we dismiss, I just wanted to share, you know, this has been just the, um, such a wonderful um, experience for me personally to meet so many of you, because over the last few, um, you know, months I had a chance to meet, work closely with a lot of the coordinators of the program, but it was such an honor to actually see the faces and hear your stories and see all of you meeting each other and interacting. And so, you know, for uh, looking sort of 
especially this last debrief we had in terms of what did you learn. So here for policy, um, I just want to share just the brief reflection that I heard throughout the conference and more so today. One of the policy lessons that I heard you talk about is that uh, school rock is not how policy works. And that for a lot of you, it was a big surprise the last time you had a policy lesson whether it's in middle school or in high school. And it was a question and the importance of of political and policy literacy and how important it is to understand how these processes work, in part because I've heard on all these four days that policy was something that was out there, not related to us in practice. It's just this big complex world. But what I'm hearing as we progress through the days is that policy now, while still very complex and sometimes complicated, that now there's a sense of how you can impact policy, be there in a local or state or the federal level. Um, and what I also heard was uh, the need for patience. That a lot of you have sort of took away that policy process takes time, but that time is critical to continue to be active, to continue to connect with your congressmen and women or uh, state legislature or local boards to kind of keep moving and shaping the policy on the ground. And obviously from the ground up, engaging your community, working with your community, building those partnerships and relationships. In terms of leadership, uh, words that were said most often, authentic leadership, courageous leadership, the importance of listening, of, um, having these critical reflections, understanding self, um, how much youth voice matters, especially hearing in the help or lecture from um, um, Efron, and how little we often have a chance to hear youth and what they need and how they need to grow and that's how we can support them better. The importance of stories and then kind of crossing boundaries here in, in every room that I went to, especially in concurrent sessions, we kind of raised hand on who's in the room. It was great to see that it was from early childhood to higher education, business, philanthropy, that everyone is in the room bringing those different perspectives. And lastly, in terms of networking, uh, lots of connections were made in meeting new people, relationships. What I wanted to sort of, to Betty's points, always relate to EPFP. So this year we have 258 fellows in the cohort. These are your colleagues for life. What I also hope you understand is when you graduate from EPFP, we have a database of 8,000 names of fellows that were here before you. That's your extended network. You met a lot of our alumni throughout the program, so I really hope that you will reach out to them through social media, through the database, and we'll send you all this information, including materials. But you will see this as part of your extended professional family, future friends, colleagues, and doesn't matter if they were in your states or in your cohort, reach out to them. There's one thing you'd certainly have in common is this uh, fellowship experience. 